Lebanon is sliding into an abyss, and my driver is taking sides. Police can't protect you in this country. Government can't protect you in this country. Too corrupt. They're too busy stealing money. They're not worried about the security of people here. They never did. They never will. As things fall apart, ordinary people are buying guns and preparing for war. First one he called, he asked for AK-47 machine gun. So we got him there. Then he called back, he wants 100 rounds. Then he called back, he wants extra clips. 30 minutes later he called, he want a handgun. I guess hour later he called, asked for RPG. People are panicking. The last thing this country needs is a civil war. But for men like Dawood, the chaos represents a business opportunity. Oh, this is a Colt 45, high power pistol. It's brand new in the box. So we're gonna give it to that guy. People are buying guns right and left. I'd come to Beirut to meet Hezbollah, the secretive Shia Muslim party of God. They let me in to film this ceremony, Ashura. These people are crying for Imam Hussein, their leader, killed in battle over 1,200 years ago. Martyrdom and sacrifice are at the heart of the Shia faith. It seemed key to understanding Hezbollah, but if the past is a source of grief for Hezbollah supporters, the future's looking equally bleak. Days before, Hezbollah had attempted to enforce a general strike to bring down the government. It sparked widespread rioting. Sunnis, Shia, Druze and Christians fought each other in a lethal sectarian free-for-all. Hezbollah pulled back, insisting they did not want a civil war. I went to visit one of their 14 MPs. He denied their supporters were buying weapons. Civil war is uh, bad to all Lebanon and to all Lebanese. And in Lebanon, nobody can win a war. I can assure you that in Dahi and in Bika and even the South, nobody is buying arms. Because uh, we are telling them that we do not want to go into civil war. And we will never use our arms to, to, to kill Lebanese people. So I can assure you that nobody is buying arms. That night, I travelled across town. Whatever the leadership was saying, Daoud maintained weapons were readily available. He promised to show me what was really going on. Come look at this. Majibtash? That's a nice good one right here. He's saying that the situation is deteriorating very, very terribly fast right now. These weapons were for sale to other Shia, but rumour had it that across the country, every community was secretly preparing for war. Oh man, that's what I want to look. This group were former civil war militiamen. Nowadays, they're on Hezbollah's payroll. Man, he put a grenade in that thing, man. Man, what a one mistake and we're all dead here. <laughs> He's a Hezbollah guy, but in his spare time, he buys some weapon and sell it to a friend of his, people who he knows, who needs weapon, he sell it to him. No problem. I was told the price of guns had tripled since the political crisis began. That's the AK-47 ammo. Still brand new in boxes. This is one of the best ones, it's the Russian made, Circle 11 they call it. This one, this is the best one in this room right here. So you want to buy it? This is the elite one right here. King War. Uh, this is the king right here, king of the war. <laughs> this is the Cadillac of AK-47 right here. Why is that one so good? Absolutely, this is the one that defeated the Jews in southern Lebanon. That's right. 
Uh, but my filming was cut short by the arrival of a man from Hezbollah's internal security wing. We cannot stay any longer because these boys are all outside. I was told never to film there again. The fighters outside. A few days later, Hezbollah banned all filming in their areas. And that's where Dawood really came into his own. Known locally as Crazy D, he lived in America for 18 years, but was Southside Beirut, born and bred. Dawood was plugged straight into the city's dark underbelly. Though not remotely religious, he was a Hezbollah supporter. Maybe he could open doors to their secret world. I know a lot of friends of Hezbollah. Sure. They're honest. They're truthful. They're religious. Ordinary people. But they focus on one thing. There's an enemy and we have to fight this enemy. Israel is an enemy and we have to fight them. Israel are occupying our land. We will resist. Hezbollah started as a guerrilla group resisting Israel's occupation of southern Lebanon. Today, it's the country's biggest political party. But unlike the others, Hezbollah runs its own army. Backed by Iran and Syria, it's more powerful than Lebanon's regular forces. Washington is worried. In recent times, it has also become clear that we face an escalating danger from Shia extremists. Many are known to take direction from the regime in Iran, which is funding an army terrorist like Hezbollah, a group second only to Al-Qaeda in the American lives it has taken. They and others blame Hezbollah for a string of bombings and kidnappings in the 1980s. Oh, you're with us? Oh, you're against us? That's the American policy in the Middle East. Well, I can assure you, my people are against them. We think they are the terrorists, we think they are the murderers, we think they are the killers. So it's okay for Israel to get funded and they get help and they get $10 billion a year from America. Is that, that's good to kill us and kill our kids in Lebanon, but it's bad for us to get money from Iran to fight back. Does that make sense? Last summer, Hezbollah captured two Israeli soldiers. A vicious 34-day war followed. Israel wanted to wipe them out, but Hezbollah survived. A humiliation for Israel's supposedly all-powerful army. The Party of God became heroes across the Muslim world. A quarter of Lebanon's population joined the celebrations. So what's the secret of Hezbollah's appeal? Their leader, Hassan Nasrallah, is himself a huge draw. To us, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah is our icon. He's the man we trust, he's the man we believe. Because the truth in this country comes from his mouth only. And if you like the speech, why not buy the T-shirt? This is Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah picture printed on the shirt. This lighter right here, it is made in a way that every time you push this button right here, Hassan Nasrallah picture comes out. It shows on whatever surface you aim. It's so popular around here. Everybody's buying it. Hezbollah run their own satellite TV channel. Al Manar is the self proclaimed voice of the resistance. Among the news, chat shows, and children's programs are militant propaganda videos designed to keep people mobilized for the endless struggle against Israel. When the war started, the Israelis tried to bomb it off air. They failed. Daoud is certainly on message, but he told me he wasn't part of Hezbollah's military wing, or even an official party member. Not everyone is a soldier with Hezbollah. They are very selective who they take in the resistance. And a guy like me, 
I don't think they let me in. Yes, I am a Muslim. Yes, I am a Shia Muslim. Uh, I'm not too involved in the religion. The truth is, I'm not. I might go out and have a drink or go out for a party. But when it comes down to it, to take care of business, you definitely see, you will see me with Hezbollah side by side. Of course. Taking care of business, meaning armed and ready to defend his neighborhood against the Israelis or anyone else. But unlike some civilians with a vast arsenal at home, Daoud considers himself responsible. What do you got here? This is the grenades right here. I keep them away from the house in case someone visits and got some kids or something like that. I don't want them to play with it. So, so that's what I use in case of an emergency. Grenades are always important in a street fight. Most of the people here in Dahi got all these things right here you're looking at. It's part of life here in Dahi. The Dahia is Dawood's neighborhood, the southern suburbs of Beirut. Like most Shia areas, it's poor, neglected, and was heavily bombed in the war. Jihad al Bina is Hezbollah's construction company. They've pledged to completely rebuild the area and have already handed out over $300 million in cash to homeless civilians. Much of that money is believed to have come from Iran. Hezbollah also runs schools, hospitals and other projects in deprived Shia districts. It all helps to keep their supporters on side. Don't you feel a bit bad? Your house was bashed up because of what they did? Well, yes I do, but they did pay money for us to relocate till they build my new house, which they will. You sure of that? Absolutely. Hassan Nasrallah, when he say it, he'll do it. However, Nasrallah has also pledged to bring down the Lebanese government. So troops are on the streets yet again. <laughs> Hezbollah and their allies are camped out in Beirut city centre paralyzing the local economy and laying siege to the Prime Minister's office. Okay, this is the tent city. That's where the protesters sleep and live around the clock. And they will not move or remove the tents till their demands be met. This was Valentine's Day in downtown Beirut. Government supporters massed just opposite Hezbollah's tent city. Love was in short supply. The two sides had to be separated by tanks and razor wire. Hezbollah and their allies want fresh elections, accusing the US-backed government of corruption and complicity with Israel. The government side say Hezbollah is a tool of Iran and Syria. They'd gathered in Beirut to commemorate the assassination of former Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. They blame Syria for his murder and accuse Hezbollah of obstructing justice in the case. The country is split down the middle, and many fear foreign agendas could, once again, push Lebanon into a civil war. The day was a potential flashpoint, but the army mounted a huge security operation, and everything passed off peacefully in Beirut. But I'd heard there'd been an outbreak of sectarian violence between Sunni and Shia Muslims out east in the Hezbollah-controlled Bekaa Valley. We go into a town named Ursel. Uh, Ursel, almost 99% Sunni, Muslim Sunni. And three days ago, they had a problem with the Shia people down on the main road, by that way where we just came from. The people here told me they felt intimidated and threatened by local Hezbollah supporters from the Bekaa. Hmm. The problem here in this town, Ersel, and all the surrounding towns around it, majority are Shia. So Ersel is a pure Sunni town. And if they want to go to Beirut, they have to pass through the Shia towns. That's when the problems occurred right there. Hmm. 
Sunni Muslims from Ursel had joined the Hariri demonstration in Beirut, but on the way home, they say they were ambushed. Okay, on the way back from Beirut after the memorial, after attending the memorial service, on the way back, Hezbollah, Amal, Kaumi, and some of the opposition groups, they were preparing themselves, they saw throwing rocks at the vans. They, des they destroyed, uh, partially destroyed, almost a hundred van, plus there's a lot of people injured. What started with stone throwing descended into a gun battle between heavily armed civilians. He been shot, right? Yes, it went right through his shoulder. Alhamdulillah. The driver of the van, they hit him first with a rock on his head. And the next thing you know, the van ran into the wall. Whoever get injured is injured. Whoever is not, open the doors and run. While they're running, they open fire on him. He's saying, he's looking for someone to help him to leave this country because they will kill him the next time they see him. He's saying, this town being sent us to death by Hezbollah. But then the mood soured. The locals began asking questions about Daoud's background, suspecting he was a Shia. We got out of there before it turned ugly. Okay, let's go. Driving back through the Bekar Valley, we saw numerous Lebanese army roadblocks. People in Ursel had said Hezbollah were a law unto themselves around here, and it certainly looked that way. This Hezbollah guys, this car with no tag. See how they, they drove through the roadblock, you know, the army roadblock. They don't even stop, they don't even care. Have to stop for the army as well? They don't stop usually. They keep on going. In the small villages like here, the army pretty much they know Hezbollah vehicles. Yeah, pretty much. They can see it. Car, no tags on it, no license, three bearded guys in it. It's obvious. This is the Dahar El Baida bridge, once one of Lebanon's finest. But the Israelis bombed it repeatedly during the war. They said Hezbollah were using it to transport arms to the front line. That's the way back. Yeah, yeah that's the way back. All destroyed. Big pieces missing. See it? They kept hitting it over and over and over again to destroy it completely. Big nice slab is missing. <laughs> they destroyed it because this uh, this is a major bridge in Lebanon to connect these towns to, with the Bekaa. And what's in the Bekaa that's important? Bekaa, which is Hezbollah and the resistance. And usually they bring, you know, all the weapons come down to Beirut through Bekaa. They use these bridges. Not anymore. Now they use side roads. Back in Beirut, I went to meet the arms dealers once again. I'd heard guns were coming in from across the Middle East. And Daoud told me there was a special weapon I'd want to see. Take a picture of the, the kids. Go ahead, do this just to satisfy everyone. The child was holding an M4 rifle, one of the latest models in the US military's arsenal. So what was it doing on the streets of South Beirut? It wasn't sweet. I found everything about this whole scene deeply disturbing. This gun, for fact, for sure, came from Iraq, belonged to an American soldier. Got killed. They took his weapon, sold it to a local dealer. And that local gun dealer smuggled it to Lebanon. Fact is, there's a lot of weapons coming from Iraq to Lebanon right now, today. The asking price for this one gun was $10,500. And this had created its own gory dynamic. 
he's saying some of the Iraqi groups right now they don't care about the political reason why the Iraqis why the Americans are there or the situation or they are worried about they want the weapon they want to take the weapon and sell it that's the first the gun was stamped that's property of the US government that's safe right? I contacted the American military in Baghdad but citing operational security they wouldn't confirm the weapons history We left Beirut behind and headed for the Shia heartlands of southern Lebanon. To really understand Hezbollah, I needed to see where the movement was born. People here experienced years of Israeli occupation, and in last year's war, thousands were maimed or killed. Now we are on our way to see this lady. Her son got martyred and come back during the summer. The war. Hezbollah against the Israelis. In every town and village I passed through were posters glorifying dead fighters. Down south, the party of God won the battle for hearts and minds years ago. Garda Hajali is 40 years old. She encouraged her 18-year-old son Ibrahim to join Hezbollah. He was killed last summer, firing Katusha rockets into Israel. She has no regrets. Well, what she's saying here, yeah, maybe I lost everything by Western standard because they believe in material things. Material things mean nothing to us. Uh, what means to us is God's blessing. My house got destroyed, so what? They will rebuild it for me. The business destroyed, they rebuild it for me. My son dead? No, he's not dead. He's alive. He's alive in heaven alive i can hear him i can smell him he know we are here right now he received she said he received the highest rank in bravery just like she's asking me well if your son passed in school uh, if we win something if he pass a hard course in class if he passed you'll be happy right when my son passed the ultimate test. Her son got martyred, and that's to her, it's a victory. She has two sons right now, they're in college. They're not in the resistance right now, but when times comes and there's a need, not only her sons will go, she will go personally too. That's what it takes. I can see why Hezbollah is such a tough organization. Even the women, look at their women. They send their kids into comeback. They send their sons to, to war with Israel. They don't mind to be martyred by Israel. They believe they're defending the, the land. It's worth dying for. Since the war ended, over 10,000 United Nations peacekeepers have moved in to back up the Lebanese army and act as a buffer between Hezbollah and Israel. The UN are here to prevent Hezbollah openly carrying weapons, rearming or directly confronting Israeli troops, like these patrolling the border. But this is clearly still Hezbollah territory. These yellow flags are Hezbollah flags. They've been put up by Hezbollah fighters just to show the people, the UN, the Israeli, whoever, they are still here and they are in control. Critics, especially in Israel, say the UN aren't doing enough to stop Hezbollah's alleged rearmament, something they deny. When you consider the uh, conflict, the intensity, uh, and you look today, then I think most observers re regard it as remarkably calm. Uh, the situation is still tense, but really we don't see armed insurgents and we don't see any evidence of weapons coming into our area of operations. I went out on a roadblock with an Italian patrol. While I was there, not a single vehicle was stopped or searched for guns. But hunting for Hezbollah is a tricky business. 
South Lebanon is supposedly riddled with their secret military bunkers. And I wanted to find one. I'd heard there'd been fighting positions here, near the old cemetery in Deir Mimas. As a result, the area had been heavily hit by Israeli cluster bomb strikes. It was a grisly scene. It's a Christian cemetery here, Christian barriers, uh, located right next to Hezbollah position. They were firing mortars from around the corner down that way. Obviously, the Israeli planes discovered the position and they heavily bombed this area. Even the dead didn't escape the bombing. They destroyed this whole cemetery and everything around. This body right there all exposed. Look. Bodies everywhere in the cemetery. They got blown out of the rooms where they were buried. Christian people around this area are, are very unhappy about the, what happened here. Let's go and carry the cluster bombs right here. This thing actually exploded in the air and all the cluster bombs just come down like rain. Unexploded cluster munitions remain a lethal danger in South Lebanon. Israel dropped two to three million bomblets in an attempt to wipe out dug in Hezbollah fighters. It's a foxhole. The UN estimates as many as a million failed to explode properly. These cruel devices continued to kill and maim civilians long after the fighting ended. And then we saw one. Absolutely a cluster bomb. That's exactly what that is. <laughs> This is extremely dangerous. I bet you there's a lot of them around too. Because you know they don't throw only one. They throw them by thousands. You step on it, you end up walking with no leg. Okay, let's get out of here then. But we can throw a rock at it and explode it. I don't think so, do you? Oh yes, we will. Don't. It was at times like this I realized why Dawood's nickname What's that? was Crazy D. I want to come back to the cluster bomb. Further down the valley, evidence of abandoned Hezbollah rocket launching positions. Were we getting closer to a secret bunker? This looks like a, a launching position. That's a launcher site, without a doubt. Because every time they launch this missile, <coughs> leaves tracks of fire behind it. The scorched earth wasn't the only clue we found here. This one right here goes on the tip of the missile, you know, like a screw. That way it won't bang against any hard surfaces. And this one goes on the tip of it, on the top. And that's the casing that holds it in place. You can see the diameter. Well, that's definitely Katusha rockets. There's below everywhere here. Absolutely everywhere. Everywhere on this mountain. You can see that. Hezbollah fighters survived Israeli airstrikes by hiding in networks of bomb-proof underground bunkers. They're notoriously difficult to find. But then, suddenly, we got lucky. A hidden entrance leading deep into the darkness. No one's filmed in one of these since the war. It goes all the way around under the mountain. Despite all Israel's surveillance technology, bunkers like this were built in total secrecy. Who would ever think there's such a thing under the mountain? All this done by hand. Look at this. They have a light system. No electricity today. These are the water tanks they use. It's still full too, almost full. Deep underground, Hezbollah fighters could sit out weeks of Israeli bombardment, hiding in places like this. Unbelievable. What was this room? It looks like a bedroom, it's a sweet here. This is the bathroom. There's a shower in there. The shower. This is the shower area. This is the kitchen area. They even have a sink. 
These guys had it all. Electricity, hot water, running water, kitchen, sink, bathroom, shower. It's a home away from home. We pressed on. Our target was Bint Jebel, Hezbollah's so-called capital of resistance in the south, just two miles from the Israeli border. The town looks a bit like a Hezbollah theme park, but one of the fiercest battles of the war took place here, and it shows. This here used to be his house. As you see, there's nothing left, nothing, nothing there. It's gone, completely, nothing there. This man saying I have nothing left. Everything I own, everything I had is gone. I don't even have clothes to wear anymore. He said, I'm wondering, the, the people of Israel, they're so smart. The government owns such a technology. They use it to do all this, to destroy people's lives. Then he is a he understand they have he understand Israel has some enemies in this country that's fine they can deal with that but what we got to do with it here our homes got destroyed but in fact Bint Jebel had been turned into a fortress by Hezbollah fighters this hall in the wall over there be made by the resistant fighters to fight the Israelis from house to house, building to building. When the Israeli troops made some interviews, they actually never seen the resistance fighters. Rarely they seen them, because they use that kind of tactics right here. The Israelis were never they able to secure them. this town. The Israelis were screaming. Every time they thought they'd done it, Hezbollah fighters would appear from numerous hidden underground tunnels to start the fighting again. That's a deep tunnel. That's definitely military use right here. These people made themselves ready a long time ago. They knew this coming. They knew this war was gonna happen. After all what you see, after all these destructions, believe it or not, Israeli soldiers could not take one single inch of the city right here. I'd come down south to meet a local commander, Haj Hussein. Hezbollah fighters Hello. never usually speak to journalists. Fearing Israeli assassination, he wouldn't face the camera. Haj Hussein lost many fighters in the pitched battles in the south, but he said war and sacrifice are just a part of life here. Uh, we have a belief, since we were young kids, we ask, what this red flower, how these red flowers come. So they be telling us this is the land of martyrs. This is the land that drink the blood of the martyrs. Flowers that grow in it. Haj Hussein said the UN presence hadn't removed Hezbollah, merely pushed it underground. Doesn't matter how long the UN stays here, they will never see Hezbollah fighters. The Hezbollah fighters are not for show. They use guns during combat, during the war, on the mission only. It's not for show. They depend on secrecy, mainly on secrecy. And then he confirmed the rumors. Hezbollah was rearming and ready for war. What he's saying here, yes, Hezbollah and the resistors are 
ready more than ever and stronger than before. Uh, there is more advanced weapon right now. Hezbollah definitely bringing weapon, but nobody know where from. This man's whole life had been shaped by constant war with Israel. I asked him if he had any regrets. He feels lucky and blessed. He was raised and born and God placed him close to his enemy. It's an honor for him. At least he doesn't have to go long ways to fight his enemy. He, he is right here nearby and it's an honor for him. Happy. Grateful. Had Hussein left. The next day he was flying off for some military training in Iran. I'd been planning a trip into the mountains just north of the UN controlled zone. I'd heard Hezbollah were preparing new missile bases. If true, they could fire longer range rockets into Israel over the heads of the peacekeepers. As we drove, Dawood told me how Hezbollah dealt with spies during the war. Down the street from our house, this past summer during the war, they caught three people, right-handed. I don't know what they found, what kind of equipment they had, I don't know details, but I know for a fact they lined them up on the wall and they shot the three, killing them dead right there on the spot. For spying? Right. Perhaps not what I needed to hear at the time. We were all alone in an extremely hostile environment. That's landmines. Don't touch, don't get any closer. Stay away. Dangerous. Be careful that guy right there. Yeah. The truck. Yeah, that's a bottle truck. Can't go no further here. Let's go back. Across the area were blocked roads, construction equipment, and evidence of widespread digging, but no new buildings. Were Hezbollah making some more underground bunkers? You don't need a genius to figure this out. Look at these valleys. Big, large, wide area digged up from top to bottom. Most locals were too apprehensive to do interviews, but this woman had a story. Her farmhouse was surrounded by Hezbollah activity. This lady lived here with her husband, with her children, but she cannot roam the area down that way because so-called the boy is there. And you know who's the boys. So they will not let anyone get nowhere near them. Hezbollah had dumped tons of sand at the bottom of her garden, a vital ingredient for mixing concrete. She said she had no idea where they take it and what they do with it. They dig out sand and they take it out of here. And she doesn't know what they do with it. Other locals warned us to be careful. They said Hezbollah would soon find out what we were up to. He say they are everywhere around this area. They are all over the place. You don't see them, they see you. New roads had been cut through the mountains and I wanted to take a look. There's some kind of site here. I mean, they're making their way deep in the mountains, right there. Oh, shit. Oh. We'd stumbled across a Hezbollah military base, and Daoud panicked. Hezbollah training camp, man. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It says, do not enter. It's not allowed to enter to anyone, Hezbollah. 
if you feel like to get interrogated for three days, let's go back. Careful that guy coming. But it was clear I'd pushed our luck too far. Put it down. Too late. We were detained and questioned by a Hezbollah patrol. Luckily, they didn't find my tapes. They said we'd been caught in a restricted security zone. Incredibly, as they let us go, they told me Hezbollah weren't building bunkers at all. They were, in fact, moving into fruit production. That was a close call. These guys talk, and one minute he talk about strict military zone, and the next minute he talk about they're making a big project to grow nectarine. So... You think they're growing nectarines? Of course they're not growing nectarine. If they grow nectarine, why they kindly arrested us? Question us. Oh, let's go this way. That way is not good. We don't want to get stopped again. Back in Beirut, it was time to reflect. Hezbollah stands smack in the way of America's plans for the Middle East. But they say they're ready for another war with Israel. For the Israelis to win in this country or to defeat Hezbollah, they have to kill all the Shia people in this country. Basically. Because we will fight to the last drop of blood. Whatever happens next in Lebanon, I'd come to realize the group's real strength is neither military nor political. It's psychological. They've grafted their militant ideology onto the hearts and minds of all these people. Thus equipped, the party of God stand ready to fight the long war.
Already a long time ago, they knew this coming. They knew this war was going to happen. After all what you see, after all these destructions, believe it or not, Israeli soldiers could not take one single inch of the city right here. I'd come down south to meet a local commander, Haj Hussein. Hezbollah fighters well, never usually speak to journalists. Like... Fearing Israeli assassination, he wouldn't face the camera. Haj Hussein lost many fighters in the pitched battles in the south, but he said war and sacrifice are just a part of life here. Uh, we have a belief, since we were young kids, we ask, what this red flower, how these red flowers come? So they be telling us, this is the land of martyrs. This is the land that drink the blood of the martyrs. Flowers are growing. in it. Haj Hussein said the UN presence hadn't removed Hezbollah, merely pushed it underground. Doesn't matter how long the UN stays here, they will never see Hezbollah fighters. The Hezbollah fighters are not for show. They use guns during combat, during the war, on the mission only. It's not for show. They depend on secrecy, mainly on secrecy. And then he confirmed the rumors. Hezbollah was rearming and ready for war. What he's saying here, yes, Hezbollah and the resistors are ready more than ever and stronger than before. Uh, there is more advanced weapon right now. Hezbollah definitely bringing weapon, but nobody knows where from. This man's whole life had been shaped by constant war with Israel. I asked him if he had any regrets. He feels lucky and blessed. He was raised and born and God placed him close to his enemy. It's an honor for him. At least he doesn't have to go long ways to fight his enemy. He, he is right here nearby and it's an honor for him. Happy, grateful. Had Hussein left. The next day he was flying off for some military training in Iran. Oh. Electricity, hot water, running water, kitchen, sink, bathroom, shower. It's a home away from home. We pressed on. Our target was Bint Jebel, Hezbollah's so-called capital of resistance in the south, just two miles from the Israeli border. The town looks a bit like a Hezbollah theme park, but one of the fiercest battles of the war took place here, and it shows. This here used to be his house. As you see, there's nothing left, nothing, nothing there. It's gone, completely, nothing there. This man saying, I have nothing left. Everything I own, everything I had is gone. I don't even have clothes to wear anymore. He said, I'm wondering, the, the people of Israel, they're so smart. The government owns such a technology. They use it to do all this, to destroy people's lives. He understands they have 
he understand Israel has some enemies in this country. That's fine. They can deal with that. But what we got to do with it here, our homes got destroyed. But in fact, Bint Jebel had been turned into a fortress by Hezbollah fighters. This hole in the wall over there, be made by the resistant fighters to fight the Israelis from house to house, building to building. When the Israeli troops made some interviews, they actually never seen the resistant fighters. Rarely they seen them because they use that kind of tactics right here. The Israelis were never they able to secure them. this town. The Israelis were screaming. Every time they thought they'd done it, Hezbollah fighters would appear from numerous hidden underground tunnels to start the fighting again. That's a deep tunnel. That's definitely military use right here. These people. King right here, king of the war. <laughs> this is the Cadillac of AK-47 right here. Why is that one so good? Absolutely, this is the one defeated the Jews in southern Lebanon. That's right. But my filming was cut short by the arrival of a man from Hezbollah's internal security wing. We cannot stay any longer because these boys are all outside. I was told never to film there again. The fighters outside. A few days later, Hezbollah banned all filming in their areas. And that's where Dawood really came into his own. Known locally as Crazy D, he lived in America for 18 years, but was Southside Beirut born and bred. Dawood was plugged straight into the city's dark underbelly. Though not remotely religious, he was a Hezbollah supporter. Maybe he could open doors to their secret world. I know a lot of friends of Hezbollah. Sure. They're honest. They're truthful. They're religious. Ordinary people. But they focus on one thing. There's an enemy and we have to fight this enemy. Israel is an enemy and we have to fight them. Israel are occupying our land. We will resist. Hezbollah started as a guerrilla group resisting Israel's occupation of southern Lebanon. Today, it's the country's biggest political party. But unlike the others, Hezbollah runs its own army. Backed by Iran and Syria, it's more powerful than Lebanon's regular forces. Washington is worried. In recent times, it has also become clear that we face an escalating danger from Shia extremists. Many are known to take direction from the regime in Iran, which is funding an army terrorist like Hezbollah, a group second only to Al-Qaeda in the American lives it has taken. They and others blame Hezbollah for a string of bombings and kidnappings in the 1980s. Oh, you with us? Oh, you against us? That's the American policy in the Middle East. Well, I can assure you, my people are against them. We think they are the terrorists. We think they are the murderers. We think they are the killers. So it's okay for Israel to get funded and to get help and to get $10 billion a year from America. Is that, that's good to kill us and kill our kids in Lebanon. But it's bad for us to get money from Iran to fight back. Does that make sense? Last summer, Hezbollah captured two Israeli soldiers. A vicious 34-day war followed. Israel wanted to wipe them out, but Hezbollah survived. A humiliation for Israel's supposedly all-powerful army. Hold it in place. You can see the diameter. Well, that's definitely Katusha rockets. Hezbollah everywhere here. Absolutely everywhere. Everywhere on this mountain. You can see that. Hezbollah fighters survived Israeli airstrikes by hiding in networks of bomb-proof underground bunkers. They're notoriously difficult to find. But then, suddenly, we got lucky. A hidden entrance leading deep into the darkness. No one's filmed in one of these since the war. It goes all the way around under the mountain. Despite all Israel's surveillance technology, bunkers like this were built in total secrecy. Who would ever think there's such a thing under the mountain? All this done by hand. Look at this. We have a light system.
no electricity today. These the water tanks they use. They're still full too, almost full. Deep underground, Hezbollah fighters could sit out weeks of Israeli bombardment, hiding in places like this. Unbelievable. What was this room? It looks like a bedroom. This is sweet here. This is the bathroom. There's a shower in there. There's a shower. This is the shower area. Area. They even have a sink. These guys had it all. Electricity, hot water, running water, kitchen, sink, bathroom, shower. It's a home away from home. We pressed on. Our target was Bint Jebel, Hezbollah's so-called capital of resistance in the south, just two miles from the Israeli border. The town looks a bit like a Hezbollah theme park, but one of the fiercest battles of the war took place here, and it shows. This here used to be his house. As you see, there's nothing left, nothing, nothing there. It's
Let's go this way. If that way is not good, we don't want to get stopped again. Back in Beirut, it was time to reflect. Hezbollah stands smack in the way of America's plans for the Middle East. But they say they're ready for another war with Israel. For the Israelis to win in this country or to defeat Hezbollah, they have to kill all the Shia people in this country. Basically. Because we will fight to the last drop of blood. Whatever happens next in Lebanon, I'd come to realize the group's real strength is neither military nor political. It's psychological. They've grafted their militant ideology onto the hearts and minds of all these people. Thus equipped, the party of God stand ready to fight the long war. These yellow flags are Hezbollah flags. They've been put up by Hezbollah fighters just to show the people, the UN, the Israeli, whoever, they are still here and they are in control. Critics, especially in Israel, say the UN aren't doing enough to stop Hezbollah's alleged rearmament, something they deny. When you consider the uh, conflict, the intensity, uh, and you look today, then I think most observers re regard it as remarkably calm. Uh, the situation is still tense, but really we don't see armed insurgents, and we don't see any evidence of weapons coming into our area of operations. I went out on a roadblock with an Italian patrol. While I was there, not a single vehicle was stopped or searched for guns. But hunting for Hezbollah is a tricky business. South Lebanon is supposedly riddled with their secret military bunkers, and I wanted to find one. I'd heard there'd been fighting positions here, near the old cemetery in Deir Mimas. As a result, the area had been heavily hit by Israeli cluster bomb strikes. It was a grisly scene. This is a Christian cemetery here, Christian barriers, uh, located right next to Hezbollah position. They were fighting mortars from around the corner down that way. Obviously, the Israeli planes discovered the position and they heavily bombed this area. Even the dead didn't escape the bombing. They destroyed this whole cemetery and everything around. This body right there all exposed. Look. 
bodies everywhere in the cemetery. They got blown out of the rooms where they were buried. Christian people around this area are, are very unhappy about the, what happened here. Let's go and carry the cluster bombs right here. This thing actually exploded in the air and all the cluster bombs just come down like rain. Unexploded cluster munitions remain a lethal danger in South Lebanon. Israel dropped two to three million bomblets in an attempt to wipe out dug in Hezbollah fighters. It's a foxhole. The UN estimates as many as a million failed to explode properly. These cruel devices continued to kill and maim civilians long after the fighting ended. And then we saw one. Absolutely a cluster bomb. That's exactly what that is. <laughs> this is extremely dangerous. I bet you there's a lot of them around. But during the war, they caught three people, right-handed. I don't know what they found, what kind of equipment they had. I don't know details. But I know for a fact they lined them up on the wall and they shot the three, killing them dead right there on the spot. For the spying? Right. Perhaps not what I needed to hear at the time. We were all alone in an extremely hostile environment. That's landmines. Don't touch, don't get any closer, stay away. Dangerous. Be careful that guy right there. Yeah. The truck? Yeah, that's a bottle truck. Can't go no further here. Let's go back. Across the area were blocked roads, construction equipment, and evidence of widespread digging, but no new buildings. Were Hezbollah making some more underground bunkers? You don't need a genius to figure this out. Look at these valleys. Big, large, wide area digged up from top to bottom. Most locals were too apprehensive to do interviews, but this woman had a story. Her farmhouse was surrounded by Hezbollah activity. This lady lived here with her husband, with her children, but she cannot roam the area down that way because so-called the boy is there and you know who's the boys. So they will not let anyone get nowhere near them. Hezbollah had dumped tons of sand at the bottom of her garden, a vital ingredient for mixing concrete. She said she had no idea where they take it and what they do with it. They dig out sand and they take it out of here. And she doesn't know what they do with it. Other locals warned us to be careful. They said Hezbollah would soon find out what we were up to. He say they are everywhere around this area. They are all over the place. You don't see them, they see you. New roads had been cut through the mountains and I wanted to take a look. There's some kind of site here. I mean, they're making their way deep in the mountains, right there. Right now, they don't care about the political reason why the, Iraq is, why the Americans are there or the situation. All they are worried about, they want their weapon. They want to take their weapon and sell it. That's the first. The gun was stamped That's property the of the U.S. government. Safe, right? I contacted the American military in Baghdad, but citing operational security, they wouldn't confirm the weapon's history. We left Beirut behind and headed for the Shia heartlands of southern Lebanon. To really understand Hezbollah, I needed to see where the movement was born. People here experienced years of Israeli occupation, and in last year's war, thousands were maimed or killed. Now we are on the way to see this lady. Her son got martyred 
and come back during the summer, the war Hezbollah against the Israelis. In every town and village I passed through were posters glorifying dead fighters. Down south, the party of God won the battle for hearts and minds years ago. Gada Hajali is 40 years old. She encouraged her 18-year-old son Ibrahim to join Hezbollah. He was killed last summer, firing Katusha rockets into Israel. She has no regrets. Well, what she's saying here, yeah, maybe I lost everything by Western standard because they believe in material things. Material things mean nothing to us. Uh, what means to us is God's blessing. My house got destroyed, so what? They will rebuild it for me. The business destroyed, they rebuild it for me. My son dead? No, he's not dead. He's alive. He's alive in heaven, alive. I can hear him. I can smell him. He know we are here right now. He received, she said, he received the highest rank in bravery. Just like she's asking me, well, if your son passed in school, uh, if we win something, if he pass a uh, hard course in class, if he pass, you'll be happy, right? When my son passed the ultimate test. Her son got martyred, and that's to her, it's a victory. She has two sons right now, they're in college. They're not in the resistance right now, but when times come and there's a need, not only her sons will go, she will go personally too. That's what it takes. In Dahi and in Bika and even the South, nobody is buying arms because uh, we are telling them that we do not want to go into civil war and we will never use our arms to, to, to kill Lebanese people. So I can assure you that nobody is buying arms. That night, I traveled across town. Whatever the leadership was saying, Daoud maintained weapons were readily available. He promised to show me what was really going on. Come look at this. Majibtash? That's a nice good one right here. He's saying that the situation is deteriorating very, very terribly fast right now. These weapons were for sale to other Shia, but rumor had it that across the country, every community was secretly preparing for war. Oh man, that's what I want to look. This group were former civil war militiamen. Nowadays, they're on Hezbollah's payroll. Man, he put a grenade in that thing, man. Man, what a one mistake and we all dead here. <laughs> He's a Hezbollah guy, but in his spare time, he buys some weapon and sell it to a friend of his, people who he knows, who needs weapon, he sell it to him. No problem. I was told the price of guns had tripled since the political crisis began. That's AK-47 ammo. Still brand new in boxes. This one of the best one is the Russian made Circle 11 they call it. This one this is the best one in this room right here. Do you want to buy it? This is the elite one right here. King War. Uh, this is the king right here. King of the war. <laughs> this is the Cadillac of AK-47 right here. Why is that one so good? Absolutely. This is the one defeated the Jews in southern Lebanon. That's right. But my filming was cut short by the arrival of a man from Hezbollah's internal security wing. We cannot stay any longer because these boys are all outside. I was told never to film there again. The fighters outside. A few days later, Hezbollah banned all filming in their areas. And that's where Dawood really came into his own. Known locally as Crazy D, he lived in America for 18 years, but was Southside Beirut, born and bred. Dawood was plugged straight into the city's dark underbelly. Though not remotely religious, he was a Hezbollah supporter. Maybe he could open doors to their secret world. I know a lot of friends of Hezbollah. Sure. 
they're honest, they're truthful. Resistance in the south, just two miles from the Israeli border. The town looks a bit like a Hezbollah theme park, but one of the fiercest battles of the war took place here, and it shows. This here used to be his house. As you see, there's nothing left, nothing, nothing there. It's gone, completely, nothing there. This man saying, I have nothing left. Everything I own, everything I had is gone. I don't even have clothes to wear anymore. He said, I'm wondering, the, the people of Israel, they're so smart. The government owns such a technology. They use it to do all this, to destroy people's lives. And then he understand they have he understand Israel has some enemies in this country that's fine they can deal with that but what we got to do with it here our homes got destroyed but in fact Bint Jebel had been turned into a fortress by Hezbollah fighters this hole in the wall over there be made by the resistant fighters you fight the Israelis from house to house, building to building. When the Israeli troops made some interviews, they actually never seen the resistance fighters. Rarely they see them, because they use that kind of tactics right here. The Israelis were never the able to secure this town. The Israelis were screaming. Every time they thought they'd done it, Hezbollah fighters would appear from numerous hidden underground tunnels to start the fighting again. That's a deep tunnel. That's definitely military use right here. These people made themselves ready a long time ago. They knew this coming. They knew this war was going to happen. After all what you see, after all these destructions, believe it or not, Israeli soldiers could